Welcome everybody to the South African Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us. I know many of you have dialed in from Australia. We've got many dialed in from South Africa. We've got many from the UK. And I do believe we've got a few people joining us from the uh, United States as well. So thanks very, very much for joining the South African Chamber of Commerce UK. I'm Sharon Consenson. I am Chairman of the South African okay. Chamber of Commerce. Um, welcome, Francesca, author of many, many books, and behind you, and I have to say, I have my copy with me, your book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have you here as part of the discussion today to understand your journey, your life, the activities and the fun and traumas that you have been through in a very, very busy life that you have had. Um, and I know people are going to have correlations to those stories. I've heard many other stories from activist families where you can hear some of those passions, those purpose, the decisions, the compromises, the things that have to come second because of what you believe in. Uh, and what drives people in these environments is just so uniquely different for every family. But so yes. many of the stories do correlate and they do ask them. So I will probably ask you a couple of stories that relate to some of those that I've heard. But I'm going to ask you something, and I'm going to, shall I say, English teacher, grammar lesson, please help us between the South African understanding and writing of the word Baobab. But we yes. write here in Australia, and the title of the book, which is Boab, so yes. and and then you've got Boab, 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 Boab yeah, that's right. and Baobab. Yes. Help me, because this is the one thing okay. I have not got an insight into these three words, because I think a lot of people think that you're... Um, um, Publishers don't know how to spell. No, there are different ways. So the way it's spelled on, on my book, B-O-A-B, that's the Australian way. Boab. Mm -hmm. The Boab. So there you can call it Boabab or Boab. It was just Boab had a more succinct sort of tinge to it than the mm -hmm. longer. And I just gave my tree the name Boa Boa. Because it was oh, a bow. Right, okay. That, that so is I'm, I'm the namer of the tree. Right, okay. So yeah, so that. that's where the difference in in names and spelling comes. I love in the book where you talk so much about the tree, but equally yes. the character that the tree brings, the African proverbs that you bring to your story yeah. and you thread through them how yes. uh, nature and the, the personality and the tree. Yes. Can you share with us why that tree? What succinctly did we? I mean, one of the things that I know about the tree that is so unusual is it flowers at night and it loses its flower in a day. And, yes. and they're not mean the moon flower. I think is the only one that comes to mind that yes. also flowers at night. Is there significance in that within your story? Well, not not particularly. I I chose other parts of the tree, like the roots and the trunk, yes. and the branches and the leaves, and when the leaves fall, and when when you know the the trunk is is damaged by the elephants, and the fruit, the fruit mm. and its hand shaped leaves. So there's something very to me a mystical, mythical human quality to that tree. I mean, and all trees are love. Yeah, and, you know, I talk about other trees. Wherever I lived, I talked about trees. And that would then end with up at Mount Nebo, where I live, and the two tree, main two trees in my garden, the female and male tree. I, I have such a connection with nature, particularly trees and animals. I have this knack of just the other day, I walked into my office and there was an owl sitting on the doorpost. I looked out of my office window. I was talking to a friend in Canberra, and I looked out, and there's an owl. Oh, so In the amazing. middle of the afternoon. So beautiful. So I just have this this oh. resonance, Sharon, and I've, I actually, the way that I saw that tree and other trees, 
that Boa Boa became my nature, mother and father, because it was a difficult time in the beginning. Life was very hard and very difficult. It's a lot of violence. And I would run out of the house and climb the trees. That's one way of safety for children in many yeah. cases. And yes. hide. Mm -hmm. Like I could hear my mother and sister calling me and I would not say where I was because I was hiding. I didn't want them to find me and tell me I had to go back in the house. And when I related this, what I did as a child, when I came back from South Africa in 2016, I went there to do research on the notes my mother had left. 40 pages of a memoir she started but didn't finish. When I, I had to, I faced many ghosts when I went back in 2016. And when I came back to Australia, I sought, I am a therapist, I'm a psychotherapist and a hypnotherapist and a mental health counsellor. And so I thought I need to attend to my own wounds, really, and my own what I had to face, the ghosts I faced. So I, I went to see a Jungian psychoanalyst, a Jungian analyst, and she was so taken with how I looked after myself by climbing the tree that it just propelled me because I'd already started writing the book. I'd written quite a bit by then. It just propelled me that this was so important to have in the book. And my, fortunately, I had a brilliant editor who's Australian, but she lives and works in New York. And she really got me and she got the tree. So it started out with just a little bit in the main chapters and then Boa Boa just had a page to We yeah. all have a purpose when we write. And you've yeah. written a lot of uh, more academic, theoretical, research-related yeah. books. So you are an avid writer. You practice like this. How difficult and why did you feel the need to take your mum's notes and memoirs, uh, to take your own life and experiences and translate it into a very different personal experience? What was your reasoning and what value does it brought to you or not? Yeah, no, it has. Not always easy, I can tell you, but it has. So initially it started really almost 25, 30 years ago. There was the Brisbane International Film Festival and there was that movie called Amandla, which was a four-part harmony about revolution through music. And he, the producer, you know, that he presented at the end of the documentary. And I went up and spoke to him. He was from the U.S. And I told him about my mother. And he said, write a book. And that was 30 years ago, Sharon. And then I, my mother's an unsung hero. A lot of the women's stories have been told about the freedom fighters and trade unionists. And I wanted to honor her memory and her work in the world. So that's really, it was to honor her memory. And then my story just became part of it. It wasn't the intention initially of um, much of me in the book. And you, you read your mum's memoirs, which your sister gave you yes. relatively yeah. recently, but had acquired when yeah. your mum passed away. Um, yes. What surprised you most? in those memoirs? Was it tone? Was it content? Was it what she was trying to say? What did you feel about your mum when you read her words? Well, you know, there were things in there that I didn't know about her. You know, we'd never talked about it. I didn't know how her mother treated her, my grandmother. It wasn't the best treatment. You know, there's a lot of I'm just actually studying at the moment this ancestral uh, intergenerational trauma. And that's also what the book helped me with. I was able to look at the full spectrum of the patterns in this family. Not always easy to face, but it, by, I, I believe by understanding, you have then options of how you choose to behave in the world, how to be, how to heal. And 
Yes, so that was really surprising. There was a lot of newspaper articles on her. I didn't know all the magazines she had. I just thought she had one magazine, but she had about four or five. And I got mm-hmm. that through the newspaper articles. Mm-hmm. What um what the you know, and her going to Parliament House in Zambia, starting the Consumers Association, that was reported in a newspaper article. When we, after she passed, um, all the the memorial service and all the write up on her, and my sister also very kindly sent me a video and a documentary that was made on my mother after she got breast cancer, and then typical her, what does she do? She becomes publicity secretary of the cancer council. There she is having chemotherapy and has meetings around her bed. So that's who you can't, you honor. Can't change You cannot change some people's purpose in life, no. can you? Now, God. one of the uh, belief systems that I have is that, not that we get cancer for a reason, we get cancer because or in response to uh it, it might be our, a mental state, it might be an emotional state, it might be an escape yeah. mechanism. There are all sorts of reasons why we get ill. We do, things happen differently to us as part of our our, our destiny, our choice system. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you talk about um, some of the trauma your mom had physically um, yes. with the thorns and therefore the breast, breast cancer that followed in that same breast. Just tell me a little bit about how you felt about that because that was a moment you experienced with your mum when you were a little girl and experienced her trauma and then she got breast cancer. Obviously, you were a much older lady then, so mm-hmm. was she. Is there a storyline there that you can share? Well, you know, okay, look, cancer's in the, for some in the air and some people get it and some people don't. I have to be careful because a lot of people who've had cancer or have it, they don't want you to say it's all, you know, that it's all emotional and, you know, you've just got to be positive. But that's not helpful. And I, I wouldn't want to I'm, go there I'm with you. There. Yep, wouldn't. But with my mum, I really believe, and I've seen it in others, and in my book I actually say she suckled through her policies and programs. And I do feel there was that physical, but there was also so much trauma in her life. And we know, you know, the research shows so clearly now that trauma remains in the cells of the body and the trauma will reside in different parts of the body. And I think for my mother, it resided in her left breast. And And that's so it's so difficult for you to understand that. Just a yes. complete change in style and in direction yeah. and conversation. Yeah. Um, your your family were not originally from South Africa, but you were born in South Africa. Yes. Um, and your mum was an activist initially in South Africa. But that yes. wasn't the only country she was an activist in. She was a band woman in South Africa. How did that impact yeah. the family? And, and what were the sort of the triggers that caused the move, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and I think you're yeah. you at Gola ultimately as well, and then yes. in Australia. Yeah. It's gone yeah. a it's gone a global trip. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well she had to leave South Africa because she was banned and so we went by train to Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. And then she you know, she was a single mother with three girls one who was severely disabled, my younger sister. So there was no wealth in Sharon. She got no maintenance from my dad. There weren't the services, all right, they still need improving, but there weren't the services that there are now. We moved to a country we didn't know an abs- anyone, we didn't know a soul, it was just our small suitcases. And we were able to set up life and... We actually lived in, because often we lived in quite grotty, you know, not the nicest places. But this time we actually had quite a nice apartment. And um, 
But then my mother moved again because she always wanted to earn more money. She always needed to earn more money. And she didn't have any particular qualifications. You know, she did do nursing, but she left school early and then did some courses at night. She didn't go to university. Then she was at a hospital, but it wasn't a training hospital. So she had no particular qualifications other than her personality, her drive, and being such a hard worker and highly intelligent. So she just kept moving. So we went to Botswana. We went. We were in Guelo, in Zimbabwe, on an orchard, on a fruit farm. That's a very interesting story there in that what happened when my father visited. You know, he set the orchard alight. It's pretty, it's pretty sort of graphic. Um, description reading, of what reading that bit I mean, you can just think of how worse that day could have been yes, um, yes. in comparison to the outcome of the fire and the, the work you two girls did trying Not to get, get that fire out Why yes is it? I know I know just amazing yeah. you poor mum she, she really did have to yes okay yes. so then you got to um, so, so, so then Zim- we went then we went back to Zimbabwe uh-huh. And I lived for a while. My sister went to South Africa to do her dancing. And she went to stay in Johannesburg with my aunt and uncle. And then, and you know, she was an amazing dancer, ballerina. And then she became a ballet teacher. And she's petite. She's a bit shorter than me. So my mum was very short too, but she's slender and petite. And... um Maybe not so much now, but then, <laughs> you know, we all put on a bit, but still very, very, very beautiful woman. And, um, yes, so then we went back. I lived for a while in Bulawayo as a teenager and I had a couple of years out of boarding school, but then my mum didn't agree with Ian Smith's politics and she left. Um, she wasn't banned or anything, but she left and went to live in Zambia, in Lusaka. I think for a while she was on the copper belt and then settled in Lusaka. Yep. And then, ha- st- you know, did different jobs, bookkeeping and other kinds of jobs, and then started the Consumers Association and uh, the magazine and set up the mobile breastfeeding clinic the Red Cross, the mental health, you know. Energy. And then your journey took you from, um, in your case, Bulawayo. Uh, yes. You're now in Brisbane on a nice yes. mountain in the sea breeze. What were the stops on the way to Brisbane? Okay, so so I was living in Harare, which was Salisbury at the time. I just was in my last year of uni. I got married. At 19, I turned, I know, terribly young. I thought I was so mature. I turned 20 a week later, and a month later, we moved from Harare to Kabinda in Angola, which was an, it's an enclave between the two Congos, Congo Kinshasa and Congo Brazzaville. And it's cut off from the mainland by the Congo River. So you can really only fly. It takes 10 days by river, but it's very torrid. And the terrorists were, you know, the, the Portuguese army from Portugal during Salazar's time were fighting in the forests. And so my husband didn't what was looked for a bit of a change. He didn't want to be a journalist anymore. So he was selling drilling bits for a South African company, diamond drilling bits called diamonds in the offshore oil drilling. So Angola became known as the Kuwait of Africa. It's a lot of very rich in oil offshore. And then he also worked for a geological survey camp. And then the Cubans invaded in 1972, and I was eight months pregnant, and I had to fly out from Luanda to Harare, and I was there just less than a month, and I had my first son. And then from Angola, we went... So I went to Zimbabwe, and then when he was 10 days old, I flew to Durban in South Africa. Again, not knowing a soul, having to set up home, just just the three of us. And, you know, I had to tell the tale. And 
And then, so then we moved from the city to a Manzantoti, which means sweet water. And yeah, and then I worked as a social worker there. I'd qualified in, um, in, in Salisbury. I went to uni there. I was the only white in my year. It was a new faculty because all the others used to go to South Africa for their training. But I stayed because I'd met my husband at the time, my husband to be, so I stayed and studied. But I typically, like my mother, you know, there was, I just, you know, learned with the other Africans. I, you know, it was a big insight for them and for me. Well, we learn a lot about each other by being together and working together. Yes, yes. And, and your, last, your last leave to Peter Australia, do you think that the degree of moving around the world that you have done, the relearning, having to meet new people, having to restart up, is that a, to a degree it almost sounds like that parallel family repeat behavior. Yes. And from your research and understanding of humans, our brains, and the way we work. Is any of that part of a trying to get away from something, um, not necessarily meeting things at a certain point in time until you are ready? Or is it just circumstance took you around the world so hard? Look, look, I think for some people it can be that. It can be. My my ex-husband was a very adventurous man and a bit of a restless restless soul. So I think he liked moving. But when when I separated, I didn't move so, as much then, Sharon. <laughs> I've been in this house for 23 years, the longest I've lived okay, anywhere. Okay, so I'm, you're not running on the away. Mount. The book has yeah. been written. You're not running away. You haven't got no, I'm not people running driving away. around the world. No, but I love... I'm a citizen of the world, is the way I see myself, and I love other cultures. And during my Alzheimer's work, when I was, you know, setting up services all around the world um, for, from the international body, I was the chairperson for the education and training committee and the vice president for a while. And I worked with WHO in Brussels and Geneva. I loved it because I had all these. You know, and I loved working in Argentina and Mexico and Barcelona. So, you know, I've had a wonderful, wonderful time meeting really amazing people and working with carers to, to set up services in those countries. That, that's what I did and trained them how to in a way, do proper well, care. Well, in a way, following your mum's work in a big I way. I did. I am my mother's daughter, Sharon. Yep, you can hear it in everything you wrote and speak. In one of the um, write-ups I wrote, uh, I read from another author who had written about the, the book, talk about the journey of truth, justice, and love, a journey of your mum's and probably in a way correlated a journey of yours. Um, where do you think your mum found the... The, the love part, because I, I, we can get the truth in her activism, the justice in the work that she did. Where did the love come from? You know, that came from a newspaper article that I read where she'd been interviewed. Um, and she said the work came from her heart. You know, I believe some people just come onto earth and bring love. And I hope that's what I do which I learned from my mum. She was a very loving, compassionate, fiery and feisty woman. She had to be to get what she needed done. I just feel some of us have the service gene and the love gene. And she, I believe my mother got that from her father. He was a very loving you, he was a very loving man, and I often say in my sessions with people, you only need one person to have loved you to get you through life and to help you overcome trauma. So my mother had really her father, mm -hmm. and I believe I had Regina and my mother. Tell us, you, just, you just mentioned Regina, your yeah. um, nanny, what we used to call them, our maids, the people yes. who... 
actually nurtured us so much in our lives when um, right. our mums were busy. And yes. talk to us a bit about her, what's happened to her in her life. Also, what did she bring to you and your sisters? Well, she brought a lot of love, a lot of love, a lot of succor and nurturing, and well, she she fed us and bathed us and looked after us and took us to the park and you know told us stories. And I used to like to go and eat with her. I'd rather eat with her than eat in the house. I love sadza and you know making the ball in my hand, the peanut in my right hand, the peanut and catching a piece of meat and. You know, yeah. So, yes, she was everything to me, Sharon. And I believe having that that care from her and security, because I really believe she's the one who gave the most security in the home. Because so my mother was so busy and my father was away drinking and or, you know, just not bringing money into the home. So she was the one who cared for us, for me and my sister. I remember uh, my nanny uh, teaching me how to take the, uh, all the, the flesh of the chicken, the yes. chicken carcass. And yes. still people will watch me thinking, how did you get all of that of what was <laughs> I considered a discarded, a state of yes. to be discarded yes. chicken carcass? But my nanny yes. taught me that as well. And you talk yes. about spending time with my nanny. I used to often go to my nanny's home for the weekend. And go and spend yes. time in Simon's Town, in the township yes. houses with my nanny. And yes. I just can't imagine in the years that followed that yes. you could understand it differently now because the whole yes. um, the balances have yes. changed for the better. Yes. But it was a very different time then. Yes. So, it was. Um, and, and what sort of contact did you retain with your nanny? As you I did up and you left home because obviously you went to Asia. I assume she didn't go yes. with you. No, no, there was no more contact. That was the last. Mm. That, that, that must in some way must be a sad, a sad aspect in that respect, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of nature of work that you've done um, in terms of your professional, not so much the Alzheimer's one because that was your sort of for the love of, Talk a yes. little bit about the career and the way you have taken your purpose into delivery of value in life. Yes. Well, I studied to be a social worker in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, at Salisbury, at the University College of... It actually was aligned to the University College of London, University of Rhodesia and the London School of Economics. So I actually studied tropical medicine and economics, which is not always in a social work degree. But I, so then I went to Angola, where I still worked in a, hot, a military hospital there to finish my social work placement. I graduated. And then when we went, left Angola, when the Cubans invaded, I went to work for Durban Child Welfare. So I worked half the day because I still had a little little boy. He was about two. And, um, yeah, and it was not easy work because I was working in the children's court and the juvenile court. So I was dealing with very neglected um, children, you know, in some ways similar to my own situation, and youth who didn't have guidance or uh, nurturing. And I would write the court reports and do the home visits. Sometimes it was quite dangerous because, you know, the, the male, it usually was the male, sometimes the females would be very angry because they could, would believe you were coming there to take their children away and then the case would go to court. And so it's pretty grueling work. Also, it must have, it must have triggered a huge number of personal memories. Of, the, of your own home experiences when you'd gone into those children. So did, was it healing for you? Is it, did you think you chose that as a profession because of what you had been through yourself? And did, did your own personal experience help you in solving these, these cases for uh, the best measure for the children? You know, Sharon, I didn't really identify so much. 
the way that I, until I came to Australia, the way I dealt with a lot of my work was I was very compartmentalized. So that was my past. That was my childhood. I didn't really bring it into the present, the way I was working. Occasionally, I'd be overwhelmed, but more from the work. And so I would, you know, go and sit under the tree. There we had lovely jacaranda trees and mulberry bush trees. And so, you know, I would, I would sit under those trees and just talk to the trees. Um, but I do believe, and even now, because my life still hasn't been that easy at different times. And I do say I come from the University of Life, and I know that people really, like in my counselling practice, in my social work, all the different social work, you know, I've had so many different positions as a social worker in different, done a lot of hospitals, medical social work in in Brisbane. I did also work in a very... Um, in a psychiatric hospital, which was locked. And I worked with the very chronic, very violent patients, actually. Uh, it was my first job when I came from New Zealand to Sydney uh, at Gladesville Psychiatric Hospital. So I, I feel I have, I understand people very deeply and I feel very deeply. Sometimes I'm an empath, so it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes I feel things too much as I've got older because my life isn't so compartmentalized anymore. My life is more congruent and I allow myself to feel the spectrum now, whereas I didn't do that as a younger person. It's actually interesting what you're saying. Um, you compartmentalize things, but... The experiences must have given you a true and genuine resilience, which South Africans have. The earth yes. and the roughness, the toughness of our environment, we have it naturally. But yes. it goes to show them how that must have stood you in good stead. But I'm pleased to hear that you have, have allowed the sort of joining up of the aspects mm -hmm. of your life in mm -hmm. a, a more a thorough way has occurred. Yes. What have you found as a mum? You've now written about your mum and yourself. You are a mum of, of three boys. Mm. How has your childhood and the journey of repeat or parallels and your relationship with your boys been? And where is it now at, as, at that older age? I'm oh, sorry, I don't sound disrespectful, but we, we've been on the planet a while. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now I've been here longer than you, I think, Sharon. But look, I think when when I separated, I felt very guilty because all I ever wanted was a happy family because I'd had such an unhappy family. And my youngest son is a social worker as well and a therapist and a counsellor. So we have, he says we've got three generations of social workers. I think... Look, I don't think you can do it all. I think there's always something or someone that misses out. Like I feel it was difficult being the daughter of an activist. You know, it was challenging. It was, yeah. And I think sometimes you can't first work, all the time. You can't be yeah. the first in a mother an activist no. mum's life. It's no, very can't. different. No. That's true. And I feel. Sometimes for my children, for my sons, they've they've had to miss out at different times with that. And I think more with the separation than maybe so much with my work, because that's always very hard and I acknowledge that, you know, don't 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 absolve myself as such. But everyone has a different makes different choices, and every choice you make has a consequence. So there was a consequence for my own children, although I have tried to make up for that with my grandchildren. I've tried to be there as much as I can and be as loving, and I even like to spoil them. And, yeah, you know, so they're the two oldest are adults now, so. 
being the grandfather that you had, the loving grandfather, you're the loving grandmom. Yes. It's interesting yes. how you were three girls and well, you, uh, your family being the three boys. It's just boys, yes. Mm. yes. And uh, how do you think your grandchildren, who you are now indicating are relatively adults, and there must be some yes. maybe younger, how are their lives different to the life you had back in the oh, 50s? totally. Totally different because they haven't had, they haven't experienced violence. They've traveled quite a bit, um, to Europe and other places because, you know, both their parents like traveling, but they, ha they've had, they've, um, they've lived in Australia all their life. So, you know, they did move from Brisbane and then go to Canberra and Melbourne. Um, so they've had a bit of change, but nothing like, I think like I think the traveling you did around the world. Um, going back to the book, Francesca, what was the part that you found most difficult trying to write, getting through a, a chapter or a part or emotion or a piece? Mm -hmm. What was the most difficult moment in writing? Well, the, the beginning, the very first chapter is a bit startling. That was very hard. And then um, leaving South Africa, leaving leaving Regina. Um, uh, how old were you at the time? I would have been about six, I think. Six, I think six years old, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was hard. Um, look... What happened, I, I did a master's actually on writing <clears throat> and I did lots of master classes and different study to write. Um, that's me. You know, I've got to research it really well and get the best information so I can do the best job. <laughs> I'm, I'm a recovering perfectionist. I haven't quite recovered yet. So. Oh, dear, um, you're going to be a long life trying to get there. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so what happened is when I started the master's course, um, we had to write a thousand words a day and sometimes more, a thousand, five hundred, I sometimes write. But it brought up a lot of memories for me, Sharon. That, that had been buried. And, you know, every, every person in the family will have a different memory. So I do need to say these are my memories and other people might have different memories, but they were my memories. And, it was difficult to write about. A lot of a lot of places it was difficult. Yeah, I think back on some of the difficult things I've done and how differently my sisters saw sort of things and my brother. Yes. And yes. I I don't know if I want to or wouldn't. But I, I so admire it. Sorry, I have interrupted you. But yes, can we just return back to that story? Yeah. Uh, yes. So um yeah, so that there were some very difficult parts, but what I what I did with Boa Boa is the reflective wisdom voice. I wanted to bring a bit of a reprieve for people reading that, connecting with nature, what nature gives us. So there was some solace, some lightness in some of the heavier stories, oh, but it's not only about violence. I felt Thank the you. love in the, the Boa Boa and the, the wisdom. We always talk about the Baobab tree being a tree of wisdom, being there for so many yes. years. Just yes. think how much the, the tree. Yes. And, and it's really, for me, I felt very much that love coming yes. from nature, the nurture aspect. Yes. Um, of complementing some of the harshness of what you share. Yes, yes, and um, yeah. So, and you know, and the the other thing is that this book is also a cultural and scenic journey from Africa to the mountain top in Australia. It's not all difficulties. There's lots of very interesting and different things. Anybody who loves, who's lived in Africa loves nature. It's got plenty of yes. visual creations that you you, yes. you put together for us. Um, in um, 
just going back to the book, the, yes. the, there must have been some moments when you sat back and thought, that was lovely. And I, I really remember that. That's a, a yes. moment of warmth. Yes. Um, uh, one of two of those stories you can share. All right. You know, um, I love my time in Angola. It was so different to anything I'd experienced. I was only 20 when I went there. And I had to learn to speak Portuguese because I didn't know a word before I went. The scenery, the um, living between the two Congos, going into the Mayombe forest. Um, you know, there were two chimpanzees we looked after. They were like, they were my first children. I used to bottle feed them and change their nappies. And um, th those were such unusual experiences, meeting people from all over the world because, you know, the, all the expatriates that came into for the drilling and the geological survey companies. It was just a most fascinating. And the food, I do talk quite a bit about food in my book. <laughs> so, you know, particularly the Portuguese food. Yes, yeah, so those were very wonderful moments. And, and then lovely when I... seeing the expression on your face, your eyes light up, your hands appear. Lovely yes. to see uh, reliving the 20 year old look. But you had yeah. another story you wanted to share? Yeah, and then in Durban, when we moved to Durban, when we moved out of the city to Mums and Toti, we lived on a lychee farm. And I loved that. And then going to the sea, I love the sea. I love the trees and the mountains, but I equally love the sea. The sea has moods, doesn't it? Within seconds, mm -hmm. it can change yes. its moods so hugely. Yes. Uh, it's also an, a body, a power mm -hmm. that I have more mm -hmm. respect for than just about anything else in the world. Yes. Taking us just on a journey now, because you went back to uh, 2016 to South Africa to do some research um, yeah. and sort of bring things, I assume, back to sort of your sort of courage to yes. sort of absorb South Africa as it was at the time. What were the greatest shocks as to how South Africa was different and how, to what degree did you receive that research content info that you were looking for? Yeah. Well, look, it was wonderful to meet Dennis Goldberg and interview him. Lovely and man. Such a lovely man. Yes. And, you know, we had such the depth of conversation was was really phenomenal. And then he introduced me to Leon Levy, who was a trade unionist and was also banned and imprisoned and, um, and lived in the UK until Mandela came back, and his wife, Norna Levy. And then I met other South Africans while I, you know, other people while I was there. They were so hospitable. I think South Africans are so hospitable. And Very warm. Cape Town wow. is so beautiful. I mean, it's such a beautiful place. And I really spent all my time. I didn't get to go to Joburg. I would have liked to, but I spent the time in Cape Town. So it was wonderful to see that there was no longer apartheid, although there's residuals of it, because I know when I went to the Red Shed, which is the, the waterfront there that, you know, they changed an old harbour and dock into this beautiful um, shopping and cultural precinct, I went, I, I just had a desire for sadza. So I went and got some sadza and some gravy with onion and tomato. And I was sitting at the table with an African man and there were some other white people watching me. And I could see the disapproval because I was eating with my hand like I used to as a child. And so and I, so therapeutic um, for you to, to, to enjoy that in that environment. It was, but it, it also distressed me to see that some people hadn't been able to embrace the changes or move on. So that was really sad. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of violence. Yep. And that saddened me. But, you know, the elections were also on when I was there, the general election. And for me to see the cues of all different Colors, you know, they called the rainbow people. Rainbow people. Oh, that was so heartening. Mm -hmm. 
And I looked up to the heavens and I said to my mum, you see, it has come to pass, all your hard work and others' hard work. I always think back to the 94 elections, which I remember far more, um, yeah. uh, to a much deeper degree, of being there with our farm workers. And you stood in the queue with your farm workers as though it was yes. a completely normal thing to do. It yes. didn't feel different or wrong or inappropriate because yeah. they're part of your household. They live with you. Exactly. So South Africa had the importance in such strange ways. But yes. it's wonderful to see how the degree to which uh, such a large element of South Africa is probably less politically or racially oriented than many parts of the globe. They really yep. have moved on in so many ways, yep. which is yep. really so rewarding to see. Yep. Um, so, is there a sequel? Oh, no, not 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 a memoir. That oh, took a lot out of me. And no, so not a memoir. People have suggested other books. I've got a few ideas, but. I've got to finish, you know, this book needs to go in the world. So I have to do that first. And rest, Sharon. I'm really very tired. <laughs> I've worked very hard. And, um, yeah. And uh, you say the book has to get to the world. You hmm. published less than six months ago, November 22, if I remember correctly. Yeah, actually, the launch was exact oh, on this coming Saturday, it will be four months since the launch. So it's, it's a very, very short period of time. So yep. your purpose now, yeah. having done the effort for your mum, yeah. what is the purpose now? You said the world needs to see it. Just take that, that, that thought from yes. the past. Well, you know, just, just this week I got an email from uh, uh, the health department in Victoria asking if I would be on a panel talking about domestic violence. So it's, you know, it's happening. People are asking me to come and contribute both as a lived experience and as a therapist and a social worker. So I think that's what the book is also doing. And that I, that are people say they've been they felt inspired. They found it quite inspirational and so that's my wish. First that my mum acknowledged and then to to leave people with hope and love. As we've said, this is a story about hope and love across two continents. If you look at the younger age group, the teenagers, the sort of 15-year-olds today, uh, the 20-year-olds when you were getting married, what will they take out of that age group today yep. across the world? Yes, well, you know, a lot of people ask you which age group is it. I think it's for all age group because it has the history of Africa um, about a two women's journey um, and how through hardship you can survive and and even thrive and make a good life for yourself and not allow people to silence you and be be allow let you be allowed and allow yourself to express and do what you want to do in the world even though you might have opposition, if it's really your dream and your heart's desire, do it. As long as there's nothing criminal or very hurtful, then then do it. That's very inspiring, and that's where the, the hope aspect comes from. Is still in this modern world, there is a high degree of gender-based violence. We saw a lot of it during yes. this COVID world period, yes. where yes. some of the most unexpected places uh, yes. gender-based violence raised its head. I was talking to somebody I know who's in a legal firm and uh, another organization, a very large professional firm, and they closed their offices in a first world country uh, because of COVID. And they said, if there ever was 
the biggest lesson learned, they would never close their houses again. Yeah. Because they forced people into an environment they were surviving, but now could not survive. That environment did not have the office to be able to go to. And you think people who are professionals, educated as professionals, working in professional firms, and professional firms not having that, we didn't have that well-being knowledge about our people four years ago, uh, and how much we've learned there. Uh, and what you just said a moment ago triggered that thought for me of inspiring people to make the most of who they are and not be held back by children, jobs, education, another half, another partner, people who yeah. prescribe for you. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, there was a lot of, uh, I became very aware of a lot of separations and divorce during COVID because people, as you were saying, they had no outlet. They were thrown together and things that they put up with because they were away at work, it was just disturbing, not only just irritating, but really disturbing. And there was, because everyone was so cooped up, there, there was this expression through violence or coercive control, so many, you know, that was bad. Oh, very, very bad times, but nothing as bad as the degree of violence in the country of South Africa in the 50s, violence in the family at that time. And, and yeah. here you are today, serene, your own mm -hmm. person, somebody who's compartmentalized, dealt with and managed all those difficult times and chapters through your life. As a social worker, as an experienced people's person, understanding psychiatry and people's brains, what's the message your life can bring as your sort of final words for us? Um, how, how can we be better people? What is your message? Right. Well, I think what my, my, my sense is that to start off with, don't be defined by the family you were born into or, or different circumstances. You, my mother and I, we weren't, didn't want to be defined and seen as victims. So we went out into the world and did whatever work. The Dalai Lama often says kindness is his religion, and that's my religion too. Even though I'm Jewish, uh, my religion is kindness, and I, it costs nothing to be kind to another person. And what I would also like to say, it's so quick, we're so quick to make assumptions, Sharon. You know, we love talking, but we don't listen enough. And I think we need to engage in conversation and really listen to what's happening for the other person and don't bring up preconceived ideas uh, to the conversation or look for something that you want to be angry about. There's a lot of displaced anger in the world. That's a psychological term. You actually might be angry with your husband, but you can't tell him that. So you're angry with the person who calls you up from the call center. Or, you know, really, it's true. Or your, or your child or your dog or whatever. So there is, there's more and more displaced anger. I see it. Road rage, trolley rage, you know, all kinds of different things. So my, my message is, Take time to actually listen. Come with an open heart. Have boundaries because everyone deserves respect. And if someone is not respecting you and abusing you, um, being rude to you, you need to set boundaries. And you might even need to leave the relationship. That's me of your story about your one work in one Yep. But, but ultimately, for me, it's kindness, loving kindness is what I wish to leave in, and give to the world. And I know that within, I know my grandchildren feel it and I know all my, my clients and my friends feel it. So maybe now through the book it can go much wider 
than it would have been just with me, you know, being in one place or even traveling. But the book hopefully gets to a, a, a wider reach. Um, IT, electronics, instantaneous, oh, okay. social media, all yes. these things. It, it isn't the book that is to travel. It can travel in our mediums to such a wide audience. And what you have to say, and what you said to her a moment ago, is it costs nothing to be kind. And, and it's what we need to give to our families, to our children, to our work, to our peers. Is respect and kind of the love. And if you look at the trauma we've all been through, as I think Mandela said, we're not born angry, we're not born ugly, we're not no, born we don't. bad. We learn these nasty things. And we That's don't have right. to be nasty. We can be good people and, and lead good lives and to look after others, to do things for others. Because that's what you and your mum have done. You've actually, in a way, put yourself second the injustices to others and respect to them for what they've been saying. Yeah. Yes, that's what I feel. And I was just listening to Rabbi Firestone. Uh, I'm doing a course with her and she was saying we were born in beauty and harmony. That we were born perfect. We weren't born angry. We weren't born with hate, as you were saying. We were born actually with love. Even you know we were. That's that's our innate, our innateness, and that's what comes with birth, children, recreation, yes. rebirth as in nature. It works like that, and that's where you talk about the trees. That one African proverb, which I thought was so profound: "It doesn't matter how tall the trees grow, the leaves still land at the roots." Yeah, on, so, on the I haven't got it exactly right, on the ground, yes. where the roots yes. are. And then yeah. provides the um, sustenance for the tree to grow even further. Yes. Yeah. Well, you have left me with a feeling of standing very tall, like a big baobab tree. Oh, uh, trees grow so beautifully tall, they do give so much strength. And it's strong people like you and your mum who give all of us people listening globally today mm-hmm. the strength to know that we've got reserves, resilience, agility, love, and hope in all parts of our lives. And it's for us to find it and to deliver yes. it. We will yes. write a little piece about your book for you and we'll Thank make sure it gets you. as much global coverage as we possibly can and Thank where you. possible introduce you to other speaking opportunities. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Sarah, for the love you've given to all of us and the insights into a part of South Africa hopefully very few of us have to experience. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks Sharon. So time. I love the work that you do as well, and I'm grateful to be on this platform with you and to reach you know, other other parts of the world. It's very gratifying and I know we've got people as far as far fetched as the uh, far western coast of Canada with us. So we have, yes. we've got a pretty wide audience from yeah. Australia, stroke New Zealand, right the way across to Canada. So we've got a good audience here with us today. And thank, thank you. you. I have enjoyed my time with you too. Thank you, Sharon. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye.